Um, but if you have a Bible, I encourage you to turn there to John chapter 8 this morning. It's in the New Testament, which uh, if you're new, it's say about three-fourths of the way through the uh, Bible, if it's a normal Bible. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the Gospels, and John, uh, there is the last one. Although some say that uh, it would have been better if it would have been Matthew, Mark, John, and then Luke, since Luke and Acts are actually written as a book together. But uh, anyway, there it is. Um, so the Gospels, John chapter 8. And we're going to dig into that this morning. Uh, I like to teach sort of a, a balance between topical stuff and more verse-by-verse verse stuff. And this morning, we have a large chunk of text that we're going to look at. But we're going to try to simplify it and break it down into three basic components. Um, in John chapter 8 so far, one of the key verses that we read was in verse 12. Jesus is teaching during the Feast of Tabernacles in Judaism in Jerusalem. And during this feast, part of the rituals of the, of the eight days that were uh, bookended by Sabbath, there were rituals of pouring out water that were symbolic, going all the way back to the exodus of God's provision of water for the people. And one day when God came back and Messiah would come, there was this Jewish hope that there would be living water again that would flow from the temple throughout the land and indeed symbolically, spiritually to the world. There were other ceremonies of lighting these lamps along the wall that happened during the Feast of Tabernacles, again remembering uh, both from the Exodus and the ancient narrative of Israel that God was the light when they were being delivered from slavery out of Egypt, that he was a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. And so they lit these lamps in symbolic hope and expectation that God would continue to be the light for the people and one day when the, the end would come, there would be God's chosen person uh, that they would anticipate prophetically would come. And that also shows up throughout Hebrew Bible in the prophets. Uh, if you read through some of the prophets, Isaiah talks a lot about God's light. And again, this idea of God being light. And Jews of the time would have also said that Torah or the written word, the first, particularly the first five books of our Bible, uh, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, the Older Testament, but that in that... Uh, that, that that is also light. So here Jesus comes on the scene, and this is sort of prepping us to get into the text today. Jesus comes on the scene, and if you noticed in the outline last week, I had the way some biblical scholars will break it out, that Jesus and John, or John is showing Jesus at the major institutions of Judaism, things like marriage and the Sabbath practices, uh, and, then, uh, then, and then he shows up at the festivals of Judaism as well. And he sh in, in this case, he's showing up at the Festival of Tabernacles where they remember the desert wandering and, and literally would build booths as well. And, and Jews today will often still remember this if they're practicing by building sort of tents out on their deck or their patio or lanai, we would call it in Florida. But, you know, they would uh, build them out there and remember that during these eight days of uh, celebrating and remembering God's deliverance and future deliverance. So at the first part of this message, which I'm not sure if we have online because we were having some technical difficulties, but last week we talked about this. John 8, 12 said this, Jesus spoke out again, and so he's in the temple courts, he's in the w court of women, and there's also where the offering is, and, the, and he says this, he says, I am the light of the world, the one who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, that's a pretty outrageous statement given what was going on in all of the ritual ceremony, the Feast of Tabernacles, and in the temple uh, courts of Jerusalem and people. It was a pilgrimage feast, so people were coming in and were there. And he declares that he is the light of the world. Now, this precipitates a whole bunch of, uh, uh, of argumentation between him and who John calls the Jews. Now, I think it's important to note as we read through this, the language in this chapter is very polemical. It's very un-Canadian. It's very, uh, it's hard. It's biting rhetoric. Uh, it's exaggeration as well, hyperbole, which was much more common in ancient world than uh, culture here in North America. Uh, so keeping that in mind, the, 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 the tension is being ratcheted up in John chapter 8, and there's a pivot, and you'll see as we'll jump in and out of John throughout uh, this year, but you'll see that continuing as we go through John. And so Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He's making an outrageous declaration. It says the Jews, and it's not referring to all, we have to be careful because there's a history of anti-Semitism related to this text as well. I just want to name that up front. He's not saying all Jews. Jesus himself is a Jew, remember. Uh, say it with me. Jesus was Jewish. Okay, so that's important to remember when we're in this text. And so he's talking about a subgroup within the people 
that are hardening their hearts against his message. And of course, he's coming to them first in very hopes that many would choose to believe, and and some indeed do, as we learn in the rest of the story of New Testament. But just be careful, because there is a history of this text being distorted in later Christendom, sort of the state church version of Christianity that it, that had problems uh, throughout the centuries. But remember the, the context that Jesus is speaking in. And the Judeans may refer to, which is the word that's used in this text and translated in most English Bibles as just the Jews, but the Judeans could mainly refer to people within Jude, Jewish Jews that lived within the region of Judea, not even the greater geographical Israel, but that in this particular region there was a hardening But a lot of biblical scholars say it's sort of a stand-in for John to say, hey, there was a hardening going on in Israel uh, at the time regarding Jesus' message. Obviously, not everyone, because the disciples, and we're told there were thousands of followers in Acts and and beyond. So just be careful. I want to say that by way of a side journey uh, excursus trip uh, about that text as we're looking at it today. Uh, I had a cold this most of this week. I'm over it, except for I'm still a little stuffy, uh, but I'm feeling great as of about two days ago. It started just really breaking. Um, but if you hear some of that still, I apologize that I'm not as clear. But my head is now clear, clearer than it was earlier this week. So that's good. Amen. So we're going to jump into this text. I want to say we're going to start at verse 31. We were going to go back a little bit, but this ch- chunk 31 through 59 is quite a passage. And, uh, I think it's important to understand that these folks, there's different things going on. If you're following along in the outline, there are some big ideas that we want to explore today, and I've already named some of them. So if you're looking at big ideas today, there's the uh, Festival of Tabernacles. I think we've already covered that one, what's with the context of this current passage. And certainly there's overlap with what's happened in the chapters before and into chapter 10 in John. There, uh, This happens during that festival. And another little side note here today, this is me geeking out Sunday. Next Sunday will be much more light and fluffy, hopefully. Well, it depends on what you ask. You're going to ask all kinds of, uh, yeah, okay. Well, I'll I'll bracket that. Uh, We see also the word comes up in this passage, the word remain or abide. Remain or abide. Meno is the the root word that's used in this passage. uh, It's referred to, and it's one of John's favorite theological ideas that he weaves out in the Gospel of John, and then we see in the letters of John, we also see it in Revelation, uh, that this idea of remaining in Christ. Uh, and so he's going to get into this, and we'll see this in the first of the three sections we're going to break out this morning. Other big ideas this morning you can see on the screen are truth. Uh, what is truth? How do we wrestle with truth? Jesus makes some interesting claims regarding what is true. Sometimes we like to reduce truth down to propositions. That is a true statement. Uh, or we, we want to reduce it down to something that we can easily uh, control and manipulate for our own ends. But how John speaks of truth is very different. He says, ultimate truth is rooted in a person, Jesus. That's a unique claim of Christianity. You know, Jesus doesn't point like many prophets do, like Joseph Smith of the Mormons, here's truth over here, here's truth. He doesn't point away from himself, but he points towards himself and makes ultimate claims. And so... In this religious context, what's going on, the folks that are there believe that they have truth and that they they know the word. They have Torah down. They are following all whatever it is, 600 and I forget what it is, 36 laws. They they have it down. These guys are the religious folk. They are the leaders. They, They have truth. And so when Jesus talks about truth, it can be extremely unsettling to anyone. Well, I'm a good atheist. I know what truth is. It's rooted in in scientifically verifiable, non-falsifiable information. That is truth, right? Hmm. Is it? How do scientific discoveries take place? I could talk more about that, but not today. I've received this message. I I went into the cave and the angel appeared to me or, or, or I got the golden tablets and I have to... Jesus says, no, no, no. I am truth. So this is an interesting thing that John uh, weaves in here as well, and we're going to deal with that this morning. The final few things, big ideas that you should be paying attention to as we work through this text, besides staying awake, look at your neighbor and say, stay awake. Oh, that was weak. Play with me. You know, I got the Pentecostalism in me. Look at your neighbor and say, stay awake. Come on, come on. The other big ideas, of course, we talked about the use of hyperbole and exaggeration and what's going on in the culture And in this case, they are trying to literally kill him. And I imagine you might get worked up as well if you knew someone's hard intent was to 
kill you, literally kill you, right? You might have some words to say to this person. Um, And then Abraham, the idea of Abraham, patriarch of Israel, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham gets thrown into the mix today. The devil, yay, the devil's there. Woohoo! Everybody loves the devil, right? Uh, hopefully not. Uh, but this idea of the devil, an actual personal spiritual being of evil, and how the devil works through us, and in this case, religious people who knew the word. Uh, they need to know more than the word. John chapter 5, we learn that they know the scriptures, but they missed the point. And then finally, the idea of the I am. So those are some of the big themes. These are in your outline, I believe. Uh, but if you're taking notes for home group to go deeper, these are some things to really uh, clue into this morning as we move forward. Well, all right. Let's pray and get into those three sections of John chapter uh, 8, the last half. If you would join with me, could you stand one more time just to make sure if you're able to do so? Uh, no pressure, no I don't feel pressurized, but I just want to make sure the blood's flowing and uh, that as we pray and we read some of the first few verses, um, we can do that today. So join with me. Father, thank you for what you're doing here at Pilgrim Church. And God, we come here today with many different uh, things going on in our minds. Lord, many distractions that keep us from going deep in reading and deep in forming our spirit. We know we're fighting that like never before with technology both a blessing and a curse. We know we're fighting that like never before in the busyness and sort of the complacency of the me-centric model of being human that we have all around us. So break us out of that today to value community, to value your word. And, And above all of that, Lord, do what only you can do. I'm a saint and sinner in process. I, I will fail, but you never fail. And so Holy Spirit, come and illumine your word in our midst today. And that it's not just a one-way monologue, but that in our home groups and in our Q&A times that we're actually wrestling with Scripture together, that I'm using part of my giftedness, but everyone is using their gifts. And ultimately, we're asking the so what does the Holy Spirit desire for us individually, in our friends and families, and in this covenant community called Pilgrim Church for this season and this week as your word comes alive. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, if you will say amen. And uh, let me read a few verses before you're seated, okay? We're not going to read the whole thing standing, but I do want to read the first section, The Truth Will Make You Free. So follow along in your Bible or on the screen. We're going to read uh, verse, actually, I'm going to start with verse uh, 30, and then we'll read through 36, and then you can be seated. Uh, let's, let's do this. Look on the screen. Hey, actually, do we have it on there? Verse 30? Okay, so I'm going to read verse 30 and then start with me at verse 31 out loud, okay? If you're willing to, no pressure. Uh, but hey, it's just us, so let's have fun, all right? Fun and seriousness all at once. It's beautiful. While he was saying these things, many people believed in him. And then together, then Jesus said to those Judeans who had believed him, oh wait, that's not the same translation. Well, that's a problem. Okay, why don't you just listen? I'm going to read it from New English. Uh, Then Jesus said to those Judeans who had believed in him, if you continue to follow my teaching, you are really my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We are descendants of Abraham, they replied, and have never been anyone's slaves. How can you say you will become free? Verse 34, then Jesus answered them, I tell you the solemn truth. Everyone who practices sin is a slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the family forever, but the son remains forever. Verse 36, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And I want to pause right there and invite you to sit down in the presence of the Lord. Verse 37 says, we know that you are, wait, let's start, let's make sure I'm getting my sections right. Yeah, we'll do 30 30 through 36 will be the first section we want to tackle this morning. So in this passage, uh, the, the debate is continuing forward. They just were talking about where Jesus was going and where he's coming. And some were compelled in verse 30 to believe, but they're not believing all the way to a full robust faith as we're going to learn by the end of the chapter. And John has another theme about faith and belief in Jesus involving perseverance and obedience. Sometimes we like to reduce it all to sort of this formulaic, I said a prayer, I got some water splashed on me, I'm good. Well, as we read New Testament and we especially look at what John is indicating about faith, that it's about a following, a continuing in this. And so Jesus says in verse 31, those who believed, if you continue to follow my teaching, continuization going on 
is what brings about this, this following of Jesus and also the ongoing salvation. Theologians debate this idea of initial justification and final justification. Some that are more in the hard reform camp would say, hey, you get it all at once, it's all fine, uh, it's all on God, you have no role to play, you just kind of go along with the. Th- it almost becomes fatalistic. And then there's extreme on the other side that says, well, I don't know if I'm saved this minute or that minute or the next minute. I better just be, I'm constantly in fear of not knowing if I'm saved or not. And, and actually that the extremes, they start to sound and feel the same. Well, I don't know if I'm in or not because it's God's sovereign back, smoke-filled, dark room will of God that nobody really knows what good or bad is or the devil or what's up or sideways on the far end over here. But in the far end over here, Boy, I don't know. I thought a bad thought. I, I just swore at my neighbor or I, I, you know, the, the person that cut me off or what. Oh, I don't know. Maybe if I die now, I'm going to hell. You know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So the insurance starts to fall off on either side, right? And so there's a sense of keeping wrestling with the scriptures and wrestling with Orthodox Christianity about knowing that we're in him. Well, if we follow his teaching, you know you will really be my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So verse 32, 31, 30, 31 and 32, this idea of remaining and this idea of knowing this sense of truth in following him. Well, you say, what are Jesus' teachings? Well, that's what we have the New Testament for, and particularly the Gospels, and in the Gospels in particular, in the Sermon on the Mount, some of the longest teaching uh, of Jesus that we have. And so we ask, do we know Jesus' teaching? Do you know what Jesus actually taught? If you think of the Sermon on the Mount, can you pull any of that up in your mind this morning? If you think about Paul's explication of it when he's applying it in local churches, do you know what Jesus taught? This Christian thing is about following Jesus, his life, his teachings, his death, his resurrection, and that is where we experience God's grace. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now, of course, they're offended because they know the truth already, right? Because they're good religious folk. They know the truth. I've got it memorized. I can memor- I can tell you the Sermon on the Mount by memory, Pastor Shell. Um, they would have said, we know the truth. We have the law memorized. We have this down. What do you mean we need to be set free? And so immediately in the text, there's insult. And we have the first of 11 references to Abraham here. He said, we are descendants of Abraham. We've never been anyone's slaves. How can you say we- you will become free? And so they, are, they begin to take offense at this. And Jesus points out that you are enslaved to sin. To the religious folk gathered, going to Jerusalem, the Feast of Tabernacles, doing all the right stuff, checking off all the boxes, Jesus tells them that they are slaves to sin, and they are not buying it at all. So we're descendants of Abraham. Well, what are they saying when they say that? Well, we're at God's covenant people. We are literally descendants of Abraham. We are in the club. We already made it past the bouncer. We made it past the guy. We are in the club. We're having a good time. We are in the thing. And Jesus is like, nope, nope, sorry, you're not. Look around us. We're in Jerusalem. We're at the temple. What do you mean? And so he sets this up for them, and they begin to walk down this thing. And he says this in verse 35. The slave does not remain in the family forever, but the son remains forever forever. So if the sun sets you free, you will be really free. What's going on here? Well, the slave, of course, was not permanently in the household in the ancient world. If you were a slave, you weren't in the inheritance. And so you might be set free upon the death of a master. Or in Judaism, anyway, the slave would be released ideally every seven years if they were in there for paying off debts or whatever to, a, to another group. But the slave was not a member of the household. But the son is, Jesus says. And so now he's beginning to reveal more about who he is and his mission on earth. It goes beyond I'm just another wandering rabbi or another person claiming to be a Messiah, that there's something more that I am claiming than what was popping up all over the place at the time. He said, in the end, you are not, you're a slave to sin and you need to be set free by the son. And now he's going to tell them who the son is. Now they're hearing this as people who think we're already children of God. We're in. We're in the covenant. We're in the club. We made it through the door. We were born in. And here he's saying, you know what? Verse 37, he continues on. So follow along in this. I know that you're Abraham's descendants, but you want to kill me because my teaching makes no progress among you. Or is it progress? Well, whatever. It doesn't make, it doesn't go forward among them. Um, 
I know you're Abraham's descendant. So he, so he admits, yeah, you've got genetic ties to Abraham in that sense, but you want to kill me, and my teaching is making no progress among you. And then he says, I'm telling you the things that I have seen well with the Father. As for you, you practice the things you have heard from, from the Father, or others would say from your Father, depending on how we parse that verse. But so look at what's going on here. The, the back and forth continues on, and he said, you need to be set free by the Son. You are enslaved to sin. He said, I know your genetic descendants, but because of your motivation that you want to literally end my life, my teaching about God desires that we humanize one another, that we love one another, that we get our identity in God, not within the rituals and the religious uh, practices that we do, but the core identity is in who God says we are. He said, because those are not there, and I can discern your heart that you literally want to kill me. You can wave Abraham flag all day long, but because of what you're actually practicing and living out right now, you are not indeed free from sin. You are bound. And so he's pointing this out. How many times do religious folk claim something in belief and proclamation, right statement, orthodoxy, right, right glory, saying it right there, but we miss orthopraxis, which is what we actually do on the ground. You can tell me all day long, you're the most wonderful Baptist or Christian or whatever, but if you're not learning to love your neighbor and entering into the laboratory of love, whether that's in home church and neighborhoods and wherever, there's a disjunction between what you're saying and what you're doing. There was a theologian that said, uh, I forget his name, but he was uh, some years ago said, you can't say that Jesus is Lord while you're cutting off the head of an enemy, referring to some of the crusaders in past centuries. He said, you are a lie in that moment because the two things are not truthful in you at that time. And Jesus is saying something like this to these folks. All right. Well, there's more we could say about that. Let's get to the second section this morning, verses 37 through 47. NPR, uh, National Public Radio in the States, journalist Scott Simon said he always avoided using the word evil when covering terrible events around the globe. He claims he was of a generation educated to believe that evil was a cartoonish moral concept. But then he watched with his daughters some of the sickening images from the chemical weapons attack in Syria in April of 2017 that killed scores of people, many of them children. And Simon writes this. He said, we watched in silence, and I've covered a lot of wars, but could think of nothing to say to make any sense. And finally, one of our daughters asked, why would anyone do that? He said, I still want to avoid saying evil as a reporter, but as a parent, I've grown to feel it may be important to tell my children about evil as we struggle to explain cruel and incomprehensible behavior they may not just see in history, but in our own times. He goes on and he says this, I interviewed Romeo Dallier, commanded, who commanded UN peacekeeping forces in Rwanda in 93 and 94, when more of 80, 800,000 Tutsi Rwandans were slaughtered over three months. And Dallier said that what happened made him believe in evil and even a force he called the devil. He said, I've negotiated with him, the devil. He told us, Shaking his hand, yes, there is no doubt in my mind that the expression and the expression of evil to me is through the devil and the devil is at work and possessing human beings and turning them into machines of destruction. He said, at one of my evenings in the office, I was looking out the window and my senses felt that something was there with me that shifted me. And I think that evil and good are playing themselves out and God is monitoring and looking at how are we responding to it. Scott Simon, a reporter with NPR. So here in verses, the second section here, verse 37 through 47, if I were to title this section, I would say, whose child are you or to whom do you belong? In verse 37, we've already pivoted into that, but moving on. They answered him, verse 39, Abraham is our father. And Jesus replied, if you're Abraham's children, you would be doing the deeds of Abraham. But now you are trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth. I heard from God, and Abraham did not do this. You people are doing the deeds of your father. So now he's beginning to draw that connection even a little clearer. And they said to Jesus, we were not born of immorality. We have only one father, God himself. And Jesus replied, if God were your father, you would love me, for I have come from God, and I am now here 
I have not come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Why don't you understand what I'm saying? It is because you cannot accept my teaching. And then verse 44 to the end of that section says this. If you're following along, I encourage you to do so. You people are of your father, the devil, and you want to do what your father desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not uphold the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he lies, he speaks according to his nature because he's a liar and the father of lies. But because I am telling you the truth, you do not believe me. Verse 46 and 47, who among you can prove me guilty of any sin if I'm telling you the truth? Why don't you believe me? The one who belongs to God listens and responds to God's words. You don't listen and respond because you don't belong to God. Shazam, drop the mic. Wow. He's saying this to the good deacons of Pilgrim Church. He's saying this to the to the elders of all of the churches gathered together. I mean, he's saying this to the religious folk, mind you. He's not saying this to criminals that are locked up down wherever at the prison, at the penitentiary. He's, he's saying this to the cream of the cream. Wow. Wow. So there's some confusion going on with them that he is teasing out for them, not too subtly, about... Physical lineage and spiritual lineage. There's great good news in this passage. Keep in mind that as Jesus is pressing his case, he desires for them to come to repentance, to turn and change direction regarding his teaching. He's arguing with them because he loves them and is going to die for them soon, and he knows that. So understand his motivation. The ultimate motivation is that some of them would come to say yes to the plan of the Father revealed in Jesus Christ forward and backward in time in this little people in the Middle East. And so he's doing something amazing. He's he's calling them in. So, he's, so he's, he wants to reach out to them, and they're confusing their physical lineage with spiritual lineage, and he's saying, you need to be born anew. You need to be reparented. You need to have something new working on the inside of you than simply external rituals and going through all that. You need to have this, what I am offering you, working within you. But they keep resisting, and they keep pushing back, and they get into this issue of paternity, and so they keep thinking literal, and he's saying spiritual, and now he's telling them, Because you keep rejecting what I'm saying and because of the murderous intentions, your desire to break and destroy relationship, you are operating under the great commission of darkness and your spiritual father is the devil. You know, I think about that and I want to think, where would I have been in that scene? Where would would you have been in that scene? Would I have been so concerned about keeping my position, my title, my bank account, my house, my whatever, my place within uh, society of the time. Would I have been so concerned that I could not hear? I literally would harden my heart against that, thinking this guy's going to be gone in a few weeks. It'll be over. Where would I have been in that? Where would you have been in that? And I think of how they're wrestling and what's going through their minds. Why are they hardening? And Jesus is saying there's actually more going on than just your emotions. There's also spiritual warfare going on over you. That there's an enemy at work and you're buying into the idea that if I could just silence or murder someone, that it'll all be over and everything will be fine. This is the idea of the false idea of redemptive violence. And it is a diabolical thing straight from the pit of hell. And we see it play out across every culture, across all of time. The humans need to be reminded. And Jesus comes to say, in fact, that is rooted in the work of the enemy. The enemy doesn't care who does the killing or how the killing gets done, whether it's governments, actors, people going crazy, whatever it is. It's all crazy in the terms of the kingdom of God, but he comes to name it and says, that is the work of the enemy. When we look at our neighbor and say, they're not worth my time. When we look at the people around us and we dehumanize them through judgment, step by step by step, we are moving in the track of removing them from humanity in our minds, dehumanizing them. And you don't get there overnight, but it happens slowly and subtly. And so he says, that is the work of the enemy. That's the work of the devil. People say, does Jesus have anything to say to people in modern North America who have written off the church? And the church indeed has made many mistakes and has often followed the wrong father in its decisions. But it comes back to Jesus and who he is and what he said and what he's done and what he's left us with in his spirit. And I believe that we need to hear that. The people in Vancouver need to hear that God has a purpose and he desires everyone to flourish in the love of Jesus 
and that God has come to reorder our priorities and how we live that we might flourish and that we begin to care like never before about those that he's placed in our lives to make a difference for the kingdom. And in that, we please the Father who is above and Jesus who is there and the cloud of witnesses who are cheering us on. But when we give up and we say, oh, it doesn't matter, when we say, oh, it really does and we begin to judge and get our identity from, well, they don't do this and they don't do that, but I do this and I'm here, and we get our identity from comparison and contrast instead of rooted in Jesus Christ, we begin to follow the wrong father, the great commission of darkness, instead of the father of lights who is perfect, and in him there is no shifting shadows, as John says elsewhere in his letters. Well, they got it. They, they heard what he's saying. So you're saying our father is the devil, right? Yes. You know what? They double down. We got to kill this guy. You know, like they missed the point by a mile or a kilometer, a bunch of kilometers, kilometer, kilometer, all of it messes it. I'm a foreigner here. I'm slowly learning. The church is mostly graceful if you're new, mostly. All right. So there's a lot more we could say. Jesus in 46 says, by the way, if you think I'm wrong, prove that I've sinned. They are, many of the Judeans and the religious folks and the leadership were gathered. He said, you know the law, prove if I'm wrong. By your standard, the standard of Abraham, as you understand it, prove that I'm wrong. And of course they can't. We learn that Jesus is sinless, that he lives a life modeling fully spirit-filled humanity and that he dies sinless on the cross. And the deeper and older magic, as C.S. Lewis says, kicks in and the father raises him from the dead. He said, if I'm telling you the truth, why don't you believe me? And he says, there's this, there's this block that's going on here. You say you belong to God, but you really don't. And so when you believe a falsehood about your relationship with God, it blocks you from the truth. And you have to lay down in humility and say, I want to be open to what Jesus is saying. And maybe you're here this morning and you say, I know I've got it all. I've got it all handled. And, and I'm saying, would you surrender some of that control to God and say, Lord, Speak to me anew. Come to Jesus' teachings anew and wrestle with them. Well, let's get to the end of this passage, if you're still with me. Think about that. Where would you be in that story? Where would you align? Verse 48 through 59. A few weeks ago, I uh, had a Baha'i guy come into my office uh, down over in the building across the way. I didn't know that. I'm still gullible, so when someone calls me and says, hey, I'd like to talk about a theological question, I'm kind of a geek and a nerd, so or, or, which, what's the difference? I don't know, but anyway, I'm both. And I was like, all right, sure, come on out. I don't know. Come. And so, And uh, it comes with all of these prophecies of the Bob and trying to talk to me about you know, how Jesus, he, he was kind of sneaky, he didn't start there, but we got there, and I was like, okay, I can see where this ship is going. But um, Anyway, we had a discussion about this and, and really wanted to say, well, Jesus was one of many, sort of. And, and, and going through all of this, that Jesus, and, and that the Jesus came, then he came in Muhammad, and then he came in. And I kept saying Joseph Smith. He didn't like that. I kept throwing Joseph Smith in because it actually made my point really well. But I kept saying, you, know, you mean Joseph Smith too, right? Who is the Mormon prophet or the revelator and, and rather set up the church and then has the whatever. And, uh, and then the Bob, and, and I said, well, what about Joseph Smith? Because he's in the same time for, okay, well, whatever. Um, but we were having, I was having, we were having a good, good rapport in this. Uh, but at the end of the day, what he believed who Jesus was is not what I read who Jesus said he was in the Gospels and, what, and the Jesus who's come to people in visions and dreams and through the church for 2,000 years. So I was just like trying to help him see, well, actually what you're saying about Jesus differs on this point in terms of his claims because his claims were universal backward and forward regardless of time. And we also see the sense in the Gospels of God concentrating the sinfulness of all humanity backwards and forwards in ancient Israel leading to the crucifixion. Because when the scripture says in the fullness of time, I like how N.T. Wright says, God was concentrating the sinfulness, the brokenness that humans do in that time in ancient Israel. And that's a one event. That, that happens once in all of this creation. And so our views of Jesus are very different. But here we see this concentration here. What is Jesus? What does Jesus claim for himself? Is he just one manifestation of God or one manifestation of a Messiah that will come again in different ways if we misinterpret Scripture? Or what does Jesus say? And here he says this, the last section here this morning, and then we'll wrap it up in this section. 
The Judeans replied, aren't we correct in saying that you are a Samaritan and you are possessed by a demon? So that was a common claim if someone was running around saying things like Jesus or sort of like it. They would say, ah, well, you're not fully Jewish. Samaritans were considered less, uh, so there's dehumanization going on and racism there. You're a Samaritan and you're possessed by a demon. And in fact, they believed that anyone who claimed things like Jesus said was being influenced by demons to claim that. Uh, so, so they're making something that would have been a common accusation against someone like Jesus. But then Jesus goes on and says, I'm not possessed by a demon, but I honor my father, and yet you dishonor me. Interesting. So now he's naming again that his father is in heaven. Their father is not really Abraham spiritually. It's the devil. Abraham's both of their genetic ancestors, but they're trying to, trying to blur that line a little bit. He says, you dishonor me. And then verse 50, I am not trying to get praise for myself. So you dishonor me, but guess what? I'm not going to try to fix that right now. There's one who demands it, and he also judges, pointing back to the heavenly father, which they would have got. Verse 51, I tell you the solemn truth. If anyone obeys my teaching, he will never see death. And here he throws out another lifeline again. If you obey my words and continue in my teaching, you will see life. Uh, If you obey my words and if you believe in me and continue in my, you will have life. And here he throws it again. I tell you, if anyone obeys my teaching, he will never see death. Talking of spiritual death and the resurrection to come that they will learn about in the cross and the Easter event. But he says, I tell you the truth. And I think Jesus here is again reaching to them. I mean, it's, they've gotten in the mud, and they are fighting, and they are just like, I mean, it's ugly at this point. And here he is again saying, if, if. And there's a hardening that continues. Now we know you're possessed by a demon. Both Abraham and the prophets died, and yet you say, if anyone obeys my teaching, he will never experience death. You aren't greater than our father Abraham who died, are you? And the prophets died too. Who do you think you are? people say, well, I can write off Jesus. He's just this. He's just that. And yet in his teaching and in his wrestling with these religious folk, he's about to say something amazing. Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory is worthless. The one who glorifies me is my father about whom you people say he's also our God. Yet you do not know him, but I know him. And if I were to say that I do not know him, then I would be a liar like you. Ouch. But I do know him and I obey his teachings. And then he says this, you keep pulling in Abraham. You keep pulling in. He says this, your father Abraham was overjoyed to see my day and he saw it and was glad. Another mic drop Shazam moment, by the way. And the Judeans replied, you are not yet 50 years old. How have you seen Abraham? And we'll pause right there. And so they keep invoking Abraham. They keep invoking their religious credentials. They keep invoking the list that I've checked off. I've done this. I don't do drugs. I don't smoke. I don't don't go with girls who do. And I know all the hymns backward and forward and even some modern worship choruses. I'm in the club. I'm fine. And you, I don't know who you are. And he says, something greater than Abraham is here. Woo! That requires that we are open to the work of the Holy Spirit and that God is calling us. Because you know what? There are things where I can argue with you intellectually for Christianity. I can talk about beauty and art and truth and the idea of enrapturement and play. And I'll do that a little bit in the retreat in normal language um, coming up in two weeks. But we can talk about all of those things. We can talk about moral lists and morality and rights and wrongs and talk about sinless and viceless and, and how they are in the New Testament and Hebrew Bible and, and all. But at the end of the day, unless you have an openness and, and unless God is at work himself coming and revealing, uh, we can only get so far. But when you have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, that's what it takes for people that move like Paul, who was a terrorist against the church, who was against it and all of a sudden become its greatest evangelist. That's what it takes for some of these folks that will go all the way through to the crucifixion, but at the resurrection and when the Spirit is poured out on the church in Acts, who are adamantly against him, false prophets say, we want to follow this Jesus. So we see many pieces coming into play here, but Jesus says to them, Abraham saw it and was glad, and they're, they're like, how is that even possible? They're thinking in the natural, they're forgetting the spiritual. People do this in the Bible all the time, just like they're doing. Taking the wrong parts too literal and the other parts not literal. And they get it flipped around instead of asking which parts are supposed to be spiritual application, which parts are literal, and then understanding that if you get that wrong, it's going to make a literal difference in your real life right now and in the life to come. And he says here, Abraham was overjoyed to see my day. This idea that Abraham saw, I think it was Genesis 18, that he saw forward into where God's promise to him that I will make your descendants more, multi- more numerous than the stars. 
Abraham saw something that was beyond genetic Israel, but something greater that would be grafted in through what would become Jesus. This idea, and they believe that, and the rabbis taught this too, that, that Abraham saw this potential in the future, a prophetic vision. And again, the text says, Abraham saw his day. Jesus said, Abraham saw my day, not that Jesus saw Abraham. And so they're in the literal sense or in the physical sense, because of course he's probably only 30, 34 years old at this point. And they miss the point again because their hearts are hard. And then finally, hang out, we're almost out. Verse 58, Jesus said to them, I tell you the solemn truth, before Abraham came into existence, I am. I am. You see, if you're familiar at all with what Christianity comes from, Judaism and its background, when God came to Moses in Exodus to say, I want to use you, Moses, the, the words that came to him was, I am that I am. Who are you? And so the revealed name of God is summarized in that idea of I am. We see in Isaiah as well, when it's talking about who God, and there's a lot of self-revelation, and Richard, ba- Richard Balcom talks about this as well, that this idea of I am who I am. And this, this I am meant something in Judaism way beyond what it means in English. It, it was the re- revelation of God, a direct thing. And, and the only thing he didn't say to finish that sentence is, I am, that we would make sense to us. It says, I am God. He didn't have to say God because that was entailed in that statement. This is the highest Christology that you, some of that you'll find within a lot of New Testament here. And Jesus making that, accl- that, that, that proclamation. And they got it. 100%, because it says in verse 59, then they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus himself went out from the temple area. And many believe this is another example of, of God providing sort of a supernatural wisdom on how to get out of that, get out of Dodge, so he could continue his ministry until the time and the fullness came, which would happen at the crucifixion. So there's more we could say about this ego me statement, but it's this clearest claim deity before Abraham was, I am. And so they don't need to hear any more. Their hearts are hardened. He has done full-on blasphemy, which is to equate yourself with God. And that is a punishable by death in the, in the law of the Jewish law at the time. And, and so they're ready to stone him right there. They hear that. Ironically, when they turn their backs on Jesus, it's during a festival, during one of the daily rituals was to remember when the time when their fathers were unfaithful and turn their backs on the Lord in the desert wanderings. And one of the daily rituals was turning, literally turning their backs from the direction of the sunrise to the other direction, from east to west, to show that they rejected the sun worship that some of their fathers did. And here they are turning their backs on the living Son of God. It sort of boggles the mind. So stand with me this morning and let's do some takeouts. Get a little stretching. Please stand if you're able to do so. Worship team, come on up. This is one of those complicated, complicated texts. There's many of them in the New Testament, and there's some that are super easy. But this one is sort of amazing when you look at what's going on. And I've been wrestling through John, and I will share some of this on Sunday mornings. But uh, in the next series, we'll do a more, uh, another topical one for two or three messages. But the takeout this morning is I want to encourage you in your notes, in your, uh, your home group notes as well, there's some, some application questions to ask. Some of those are things like this. How do you see truth? Um, Jesus is putting this charge to his contemporaries that they're confusing sort of their lineage physically with their spiritual lineage. And the reformers, and I, th- and, and, uh, I think Corey Ten Boom also picked up this phrase, said, God has no grandchildren. That each one of us has to make a choice with what we do with Jesus. And he's sharpening this for them. And again, they're the religious folk. They're the people there for the festival. And maybe you're here this morning and you've ticked off all the boxes. But is that relationship moving forward? Is that that sense of I hunger and thirst for Jesus in my life? I'm talking with him. I'm wrestling with applying the Sermon on the Mount. I'm welcoming his spirit into my life. I don't know where you're at with that, but, but you know and God does. I also want to let you know that the devil, it's interesting how the power of evil works here. The devil is not in secret partnership with God. The devil is a force of wickedness designed to, to keep you blinded from the truth of Jesus. There's spiritual warfare over it. There's, 
we're, we're working a turnaround here at Pilgrim Church, and you need to understand there is spiritual warfare in this. The enemy does not want another messy local church to continue to move forward and to grow and to impact our neighbors and our friends and our family and those people we don't even know yet in a new way for a new season. The enemy doesn't want that. So he's going to work through discouragement, confusion, uh, uh, disappointment. He's going to work through all of those things. And that war isn't going to happen out there. That spiritual warfare is right in each one of our hearts. These were the religious folk. The warfare was in their hearts. And they began to go down a trail of negative group think. Or rather, in their case, they had the power and the authority. They were wanted to cling on to what they had. And Jesus said, guess what? If you don't change and you don't get away from your murderous ways with me, the Romans are going to come in and wipe you out. And you know what? Jesus prophesied the literal destruction of Jerusalem because their murderous way of doing religion through judgment and comparison and false holiness didn't save them. And they're destroyed, literally. Thank God we don't live in that era anymore. But if we think in our spiritual application... Where are we at with Jesus? Where are we at with going through the ritual or engaging the kingdom work? All right, well, let's pray. Lord, thank you for what you're doing in this place. Thank you that you do want to keep us from the distortions and the lies of the enemy and that you are the son who can set us free from sin. Those things that dehumanize us, those things that take us away from being beloved children of God and seeing others that way those things that cause us to not see everyone that you've created of being of invaluable and estimable worth, those things that the enemy desires to steal, kill, and destroy, that you want to set us free from that. Lord, I pray today that you would do an awakening work in our hearts like never before, as only you can do. Continue that work in this house. Give us hope and a vision. Help us to dream again for a new season in our lives as your people and turn us outward. Make us useful and usable for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.